Um, so being a pastor, you run into all sorts of kind of unique difficulties, unique problems. Um, one of the difficulties that um, I think I find most pressing, that kind of most often arises, <clears throat> is that when someone that follows Jesus holds two contradictory beliefs, two contradictory ideas, or maybe a contradictory belief and a, uh, an action that doesn't follow that belief. Um, and, and when this happens, they don't experience any dissonance. Now, dissonance is just a, a fancy word that basically uh, it's talking about that feeling you get um, when, you, when you have these, um, when you find out that the two beliefs you have uh, don't, uh, they can't exist together. They can't, they can't both be um, a reality at the same time, or at least it appears that way. Now, often um, within the church, um, this dissonance, this discomfort, when we find out two things can't fit together, um, we ignore it. We're afraid of it. It is uncomfortable. And, and when we ignore it, when we, when we set it to the side, uh, that, that's actually a real problem because um, dissonance, this, 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 this discomfort that we feel, is actually a really important part of life. It's a really healthy part of our lives. You see... <clears throat> This discomfort, it helps us to recognize when we should let go of something, when we should let go of a, uh, a, maybe a belief we've held since we were a little kid. Uh, maybe it's time to move on from that to something else. <clears throat> it also helps us to align our values. It, it helps us to prioritize them, to say, this value is more important than this value. It's also uh, an indicator that goes off when we're doing something um, that doesn't align with our beliefs. Our actions are not lining up with our beliefs, and so we get this discomfort in our mind, this, this dissonance. <clears throat> now, I, I mentioned this here at the beginning because I, I think that, there, um, that this, this is happening in our church in a way, um, where, we, where we're, um, we have two conflicting beliefs that, that don't add up, that we should be experiencing some level of discomfort. We should be experiencing this, this discomfort, this, this conviction. There's something that needs to change. There's a decision that needs to be made as a community. Now, in order to do this, in order to see this thing that we're ignoring, I think, uh, we're going to look at the book of Philippians. We're going to continue on in our series through the book of Philippians. Now, before we can jump in and, and, and start off where we, where we left off, I just want to refresh you on where we've been. Uh, the first Sunday we looked in Philippians, we looked at the introduction, and we found out that uh, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter, and it's a letter that he's writing to this church in this Roman colony called Philippi. <clears throat> and so he gives this introduction, and he gives this greeting, and then after this greeting, he, he just pours on the thanksgiving for these people. He tells them just how joyful he is for them. That he, that he goes to God continually praying for them. And he also says that he's confident that um, God will complete the good work that he's started in them. He's, he's, he is confident that they will be brought to completion. They will be uh, made a new creature in Christ. <clears throat> And he, he kind of concludes this by praying that. He prays this prayer of completion, this prayer that they would be um, restored, that they would be renewed. Even though he's confident that God's going to do it, he still prays it. And that's where we pick up. And that's, uh, we start in verse 12. And we're going to work through to verse 18. <clears throat> now, Paul transitions from this prayer. So he's, he's talking about this prayer that he's going to give. Um, and then he, he prays for them, and then he, he moves into updating them on just what it is he's been doing, how his ministry is going, how, how things are turning out. And this is what he starts off saying. He, he starts at verse 12 and goes through verse 13 here, and he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard 
and to all the rest that, that my imprisonment is for Christ. Now, when Paul says this, uh, I want you to know, brothers, he, he's making a clear transition. He's like, okay, I, I've said this prayer for your completion, and now I'm going to transition to telling you, here's what's been going on. Here's what's been happening. And notice that he uses familial language. He uses this language uh, which communicates the bond that they share, this, this close familial relationship. And, and what he's doing here is he's appealing to them to know something, to be aware of something, to be um, in tune with something. And what he wants them to understand is that what has happened to him has really served to advance the gospel. Now, when Paul says what has happened to him, this is what he wants them to know. But he doesn't really give us a ton of details. But what we know from uh, later in the book is that Paul is in a Roman prison. And I think it's important that we, we take a moment and think about what that would be like, what it would have been like to be in a Roman prison. Paul would have been arrested. And, and, and let's think about what that looked like in the ancient world. Um, there, were, there were no body cams. Um, this would have been a really uncomfortable experience. Um, if they wanted to throw a sucker punch in, they could. If they wanted to take your personal possessions, they could. This would have been a deeply uncomfortable thing. But it got worse for Paul. Not only was he arrested, he was then taken to prison. And look, if we think about a Roman prison, uh, this was not a place of decadence. This was not a place of uh, happy thoughts. It was a place of suffering place of uh, exploitation from the guards and from other prisoners. Uh, imagine the, the constant smells, smells of urine and of feces. Now, having been arrested and imprisoned, it, it probably got a little bit worse. You see, Paul would then, uh, after months and months of sitting, would have then probably been taken before a judge. Now, we have to think about this a little bit. Um, sitting before this judge, this isn't like a judge today. This judge didn't face a ton of accountability. This judge uh, had your life in his hands. He could pass a decree, and it could change your entire life. He could make an accusation against you, and you could do nothing to defend yourself. And so as you approach him, likely you would feel tremendously vulnerable, tremendously afraid, tremendously scared about what your future would look like. So when Paul says, what has happened to me, uh, if, from an outside perspective, uh, this, is, uh, this would have been a, uh, an ordeal of suffering. Uh, this would have been a, a, an ordeal of humiliation, uh, a, an ordeal that um, was painful, both to your mind and to your body. But I think what's, what's so fascinating here is that Paul does not mention any of this. He simply refers to it as, what has happened to me? You see, he has little regard for his personal suffering. Instead, Paul's most urgent concern is that this ordeal, his time in prison, this suffering that he's endured, has advanced the gospel. It has really served to advance the gospel. Now, what Paul means when he says, really, is he's saying, uh, this is something that was, uh, most people would not expect. You see, people would see this as a hindrance to the advancement of the gospel. They would see this as, as a roadblock in the path. But what Paul is saying is it's actually the opposite. He says that it served to advance the gospel. Now, this word advance is actually really kind of fascinating. Uh, it's, it's, it's very similar to our word pioneer. It's this idea of um, what would happen is you'd have these guys who would go out in front of an army and they would clear out a way so that the army could pass through more easily. And so Paul's saying this thing, um, <clears throat> his imprisonment, his, these chains that are around him that are meant to hinder the spreading of the gospel, they have in fact served to advance it. They've made him a pioneer of the gospel. He doesn't focus... Uh, Paul doesn't focus here upon his personal suffering. He's concerned with the gospel. He's concerned with the advance of the gospel. 
his vision, his hope, is that the gospel would be advanced, that the gospel would be taken to the world. And if his suffering is a part of that, Paul is all for it. I think what we see here is that Paul's beliefs are on display for us. We're we're finding out what Paul truly believes, what he truly holds deep down. And as he reflects on his success, as he looks on his ministry, as he he thinks about what does this look like that I've just been on this missionary journey and now I'm in jail, um, for him it's a success. It's a success because the gospel has advanced. And uh, so um, before we continue, uh, what I want to draw to mind here for you uh, is look how Paul is reframing things um, in light of this priority, in light of this priority of advancing the gospel. I think we'll see him build on this. We'll see how this framework that he's looking at the world through uh, begins to shape his worldview. It begins to shape the way that he looks at the world, the way that he looks at success. Now, Paul moves on, and he's going to tell us um, several of the ways. He's going to give us two. He's going to give us two ways in which um, his imprisonment has really served to advance the gospel. Because this is an unexpected thing, because it's a thing that no one would expect, Paul is going to give us evidence. So the first evidence that he gives us, he says, So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard to all the rest that I am in chains for Christ Now, we've got two groups here. We've got the Imperial Guard. These were guys that were extremely powerful. They were kind of the personal bodyguards of the Emperor of Rome. And in fact, um, as we look at history, at some points, they actually controlled the Emperor. They exerted force over the Emperor. So they were really the most powerful force at times. Now, when he says there's the whole Imperial Guard, he's talking about about 9,000 of them. Now, the, um, the second group is all the rest. Now, this, this group is probably, we don't know for sure, but this group is probably um, some of the people that hung around Caesar, or it could just kind of refer to the general population that Paul's interacted with. We're not really sure. <clears throat> but we, what we do know is that to both these groups, to these uh, imperial guards and to this other group of people Paul says that um, it has become known that he is in chains for Christ. Again, it has become known to these groups that that he is in chains for Christ. Now, what Paul is saying here is actually, it's really deep. It's actually a really kind of powerful point that we kind of miss as we read through it in English. You see, to the Roman people, and also to, especially to these Roman imperial guards, um, this idea of uh, chains uh, was very uh, symbolic. You see, the chains that were put around a prisoner's arms or legs, they were evidence of Caesar's power. They were Caesar's chains. They were an indicator that Caesar's will was being fulfilled. It demonstrated his lordship over this person. What Paul is telling us here is that uh, his chains are no longer recognized as the chains of Caesar. These people that he's talking about, this imperial guard and this other group, uh, they no longer see these chains as a result of Caesar. Instead, it is known to them that Paul is in chains because of the lordship of Jesus. Yes. See, Paul has taken all these opportunities while he's been in jail to share the gospel, to, to tell them that he is here and for good reason. You see, I think Paul, again, as I said a little bit earlier, he's modeling this idea of reframing your perspective in light of the advancement of the gospel. As we think, as we prioritize advancing the gospel, suddenly those things that uh, were meant to hinder us Suddenly, God begins using them to spread the gospel. And I I think one of the things that we can take home from from this part, especially from this first example, is that God will use our suffering to advance the gospel. Mm 
that he will use situations that cause us discomfort. He will use situations that cause us suffering to advance the gospel. <clears throat> and, and I think if we go even deeper than that, God will take those things that uh, are meant to be roadblocks for the advancement of the gospel, and he will turn them around, and he will use them to advance the gospel. He will take the chains, and he will use them to advance the message of Jesus. Now, Paul offers the second evidence that his imprisonment has served to advance the gospel, saying in verse 14, <clears throat> And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now, when Paul says most of my brothers, what he's talking about here, he's transitioning from this wider group of people who he interacts with every day, these prison guards and these, um, this general population that hangs around Caesar, and now he turns to his faith community, his brothers. And he says um, most, most of them. So obviously there were some that were not on board. But... He, he turns to his faith community, and he says the majority of this faith community, uh, there's a change that's happened. There's something that is uniquely different about them that, that wasn't occurring before my imprisonment. And, and, and it says, he says that they have become confident. Mm -hmm. They have grown in certainty. They have become more certain yes. in the Lord. Now, Paul says this has come about because of his imprisonment. That these, that, this, that these believers have become more confident. They have become more confident in the Lord. And I think likely what's going on here is that they saw what God was doing with Paul's fearless ministry. That as Paul uh, fearlessly went forward proclaiming the gospel, they saw him as an example. They saw just what God could do even with um, this one person. And so they felt confident that they could do the same. Now, the fruit of this confidence, the, the result of this confidence that they've they gained from watching Paul, from seeing Paul, is that they are much more bold. It's great English there. To speak the word without fear. You see, they, what, what has happened, this change, this unique change that has taken place because of Paul's imprisonment, is that uh, they were once bold in proclaiming the gospel, but now they are exceedingly more bold. They have grown in their boldness to uh, declare the um, gospel, to declare that Jesus is Lord. Uh, a simple way to think about it is that they're uh, willing to take more risks. They're willing to risk their lives. They're willing to risk more of what they possess because of Paul's imprisonment. I think this should give us pause. You know, I, I think we can take from Paul's example here. I think like this faith community, uh, we can see this as an example for ourselves. As we look at uh, what, just what God did with Paul's chains, I think we can expect that for ourselves. That well, God will take those things if we are uh, working to advance the gospel. God will take those things that are meant to get in our way and he will turn them on their head. The gospel message will be spread. The gospel message will advance. Now, after telling them the good news, Paul has to give them a little bit of bad news. Uh, he moves on to say a little bit of this bad news in verses 15 through 17. This is what he says. He says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love knowing that I am here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So Paul mentions, again, two groups here. Uh, the first group is um, some, and then the second group is others. They are introduced in verse 15. Um, and one of the things we should know about both of these groups, uh, there's two things they have in common. The first is that they're both Christians. Um, he doesn't say they're sheep in wolf clothing. He doesn't address them as um, snakes, as he does elsewhere. <laughs> he, doesn't, um, he, he doesn't call them out as non-Christians, wolves in sheep clothing. Instead, he refers to them as, in a, in a way that uh, indicates to us that, he's a, that these are Christians, both the people that are um, uh, viewed negatively here and those who are viewed positively. 
And the other thing that is really kind of interesting that he's saying here is that both of them preach the same message. They both preach the same thing. They're not preaching some different gospel. You see, if we look through Paul, when somebody preaches the, uh, something other than the gospel, he's going to say something. He's not going to say that they're preaching Christ. <clears throat> now, although these, these two groups share the same identity, they share this identity as Christ followers, and though they share the same message of Christ, <clears throat> um, I think I need, to, I need to clarify something. When he, when he says um, that they preach Christ, this means that they're preaching the message of salvation. They're preaching the message that uh, we can have reconciliation with God, eternal life, only through Jesus Christ. Um, and resu- and <clears throat> Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. So when he says they're preaching Christ, the message of Christ, that's what, that's what he's talking about. Now, with that in mind, we now understand that these, this group has... Uh, the same identity and the same message that Jesus Christ is Lord, that um, his message is one of salvation, one of reconciliation with God. <clears throat> the problem here becomes that Paul draws a sharp distinction between these two groups. The first group, he says, uh, preach out of selfish ambition. That is, they're, they're deeply concerned with their own personal success. They preach uh, out of envy. That is, they are jealous And they preach out of rivalry. That is, they're in competition, fierce competition, hoping to defeat the other person, and that's why they're preaching the message of Christ. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, when when all these things are present, Paul uses this word insincere to kind of sum up what's going on. You see, they're preaching the message with ulterior motives. They're preaching Christ not for the sake of the gospel, not so that the gospel would be known, but for ulterior motives. And Paul actually gets really specific. He, he, he talks about their goal, the goal that they're, they're trying to get to. And, and the goal that, that he specifies is that they're, they're doing this, they're preaching in this way to afflict, Paul, uh, to afflict Paul in his imprisonment. So while Paul's in jail, they're, they're trying to go after him. It's kind of weird. These, people, these, these guys are they're trying to go after Paul. They're trying to take advantage of the fact that he's in jail. They're trying to make him suffer more while he's in jail by preaching Christ. <clears throat> but what we see here is that God is, again, using um, these, their ambitions. He's taking their ambitions. He's taking their strivings, um, and he's turning them on their head. He's using them to preach the message of the gospel. <clears throat> Uh, these things that are being used, uh, that these people think are going to hinder Paul, Paul's in fact um, not hindered by them. They are in fact advancing the very goal that he was seeking out himself. Now the second group, uh, they preach Christ, they preach the, preach the message of salvation <clears throat> out of goodwill. That is, they proceed forward in preaching uh, with good as their objective. Their ultimate motivation is love. They do this out of a deep affection. Now, this affection here uh, is actually really interesting because um, you don't see this often in, in, in Paul's writings. Um, we, we know that they're preaching out of an affection for Jesus. They're preaching the message of the gospel. It's to do so in a way that is loving and sincere, is to preach out of a love for Christ. But Paul is actually the, ob- the object here. Pa- they're, they're doing this out of a love for Paul. <clears throat> you see, when he says, um, they d- the, uh, um, they're aware they do this in love for Paul. We see this when he says <clears throat> they, they preach because they, they are aware that he is in prison for the defense of the gospel. You see, knowing that, that Paul is in jail, knowing that Paul has been restrained, um, and <clears throat> what has ended up happening is these guys have, have seen there's a gap to fill. Uh, we need to fill this gap. They've stepped up and they've continued on in Paul's mission. They have carried on the mission of of preaching the gospel. They have partnered with him. You see, we talked about this last week, how Paul was so thankful for the partnership that he shared with these people. And so we see this this partnership working out here, that they've done this out of a deep affection for Paul. They said, you know what, Paul's mission was to bring the gospel to the world. Let's get on board. You know, and he's been imprisoned. Let's continue on preaching the gospel. 
<clears throat> now, Paul, having made a distinction between these two parties, having lifted up those who um, are preaching the gospel for, with sincere motives, who are preaching the gospel with, um, um, from love, and having uh, called out, having um, exposed those who are preaching the gospel for selfish ambition with insincere motives, <clears throat> Paul then raises a question which he answers in verse 18. This is what he says. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. So Paul's saying in response to this insincerity, in response to these ulterior motives, he says, what then? And essentially, the way we could kind of translate this is, um, so what? The way that we kind of translate it is, so what? You see, his, his, his response to this question is that Christ is being proclaimed, and in that he will rejoice. Yes. Paul rejoices. He celebrates deeply the advancement of the gospel. Whether it's in, when he's in chains, whether it's when people are trying to uh, have this weird competition with him about preaching, he's able to rejoice in the gospel advancing even when it directly impacts him. Now, I, I want to be clear here. Paul is not condoning that we preach with ulterior motives. He clearly uses critical language of this uh, behavior. <clears throat> what we should instead draw uh, from this is that Christ is the content of the message, and that is what matters. That is what Paul is concerned with. He's setting aside his own personal ambitions. He's setting aside his own personal desires and saying, uh, the gospel is advancing. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to rejoice in that. There's a quote that I think is really powerful uh, this is what it says. The advancement of the message, not the advancement of Paul, is the source of Paul's joy. You see, Paul experiences no dissonance between his ambition and between the advancement of the gospel. It's clear to him which one has the priority. The priority is advancing the gospel. The priority is proclaiming the gospel to Paul. It's crystal clear to him. There's no alternative belief going on. There's no a belief that should be conflicting with that belief. Uh, Paul's ambition falls away. Paul's um, suffering falls away as he looks at the advancement of the gospel. Now, in the beginning, I, I spoke of dissonance, which I hope... Uh, to provoke within you this discomfort that I, I would hope to bring you because I think it, uh, it will serve the purpose of, of motivating you, of moving you in the right direction. <clears throat> I spoke of a change that I think needs to happen. You see, uh, we have this belief because, because like Paul, we're united to Christ. Because like Paul, uh, we have been brought into eternal life. We too share this value, this priority of advancing the gospel. Yet often, the slightest discomfort can set us off the rails. It will keep us from the opportunity to advance the gospel. The slightest discomfort will keep us from proclaiming the gospel, from taking those opportunities that are presented to us to um, share Christ, to share the good news of Jesus with others. Now, I don't think that we should experience this dissonance because, we do not, because we're not all missionaries on some distant continent or because we do not often um, stand on street corners um, proclaiming the gospel or handing out tracts. I think instead we should experience this dissonance as we look, as we, as we consider the littlest members of our covenant family. The children. Uh, I don't often end with a question, but I want to end with a question, and I hope this question um, helps you to recognize, it provokes within you a little bit of dissonance, a little bit of discomfort. 
that you can think about. And here's, here's the question that I have for you. How is it that we can believe that the, uh, with Paul, believe with Paul, that the advancement of the gospel, the proclamation of the gospel, the declaration that Jesus Christ has come and we can share in his life and resurrection. And, and we believe this as uh, the central part of our existence. Yet, we struggle to find those um, willing or even, uh, I would say, eager to help teach the children in Sunday school. Mm. On that, let's pray. Lord God, um, as we consider this question, um, help us to begin to share in this value that Paul has, um, this value that the gospel, uh, that when the gospel is advancing, we can rejoice. Help us to see those ways in which we ignore that, Lord. And not even looking to our local community, but just looking within our own body. How is it that we have uh, failed to do this? How is it that we have failed to embody this value? Lord, I, I pray for some serious discomfort within us, Lord. Um, make us uncomfortable, Lord, with the fact that we struggle to bring people in to teach the children. These, these littlest members of our community. Lord, give us discomfort, Lord. Help us, motivate us to change as a community. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen.